Boldwood presents Home on Folly Farm Written by Jane Lovering And read by Rose Robinson The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Chapter 1 There are some people whose voices go straight through you Even if you are horizontal with your face in a bucket and your arm in a sheep My sister's voice was one of them what the hell are you doing? Yep, like a steel toe cap through slurry. I hadn't heard her arrive. The jump it caused me made the U struggle against the pressure of my hand. I'm laying lino, I said, obviously. I stretched my fingers to their furthest extent, felt the U strain with another contraction, and then pushed gently. The lamb's head popped down into the birth canal. I would not show how surprised I was to see my sister. I would not. Yeah, but does it have to be here? I hadn't been expecting to see Cass for, ooh, another five years at least, if ever. I suspected there was probably a warning email sitting in my inbox from our mother who, although she could be a little bit distant, wasn't actively hostile, so she would have tried to prepare me. But I'd been so busy. I had to work on not gritting my teeth too visibly as I gradually stood up away from the sheep watch the lamb slither out onto the straw bed of the pen and sneeze, while I tried to think of something to say. Where would you suggest? I asked. Benidorm? The ewe reached around and began to lick her lamb clean. Job done. I wiped my arm with the handful of straw that I realised I was clutching as though it were a stand-in for my sister's neck. Well, surely the vet does that sort of thing. Just on the edge of vision, I could see Cassandra sitting down on a bale of hay, carefully folding her long legs up into a yoga pose, calculated to make me look even more graceless in my practical but unglamorous farming wellingtons and amniotic stained jeans. I thought you were going out with the vet anyway. Would he not do you mate's rates? And your arm is disgusting. Don't you have hot water in a towel, like in James Herriot? I sighed and climbed up and out over the metal hurdles that formed the lambing pen. No, and yes, I was going out with Chris, but we split up six months ago. I did tell you I was having my heart broken, but you were probably, I don't know, getting a bikini wax or something. Cass tossed her hair, which she did more often than a dog groomer having a good clear out. A bikini wax is more painful than heartbreak, my sister said firmly. And more frequent. Heartbreak you don't get every eight weeks from a permatanned sadist with acrylic nails. I thought about Elvie, who ran the local riding stables, and who had, so I'd found out, been keeping Chris entertained, on and off, for much of the past couple of years. Oh, I don't know. Not that you'd know, anyway, Cass finished, looking at me as though she could see my pubic hair creeping its way out through the waistband of my jeans and attempting to coat my torso. There's not much time for that sort of thing, I replied tartly. What with the rare sheep breeding and all, it's surprising I can find time to fit in my massage sessions and the weekly blow dry. My hair was currently scraped into a ponytail and had hay tangled in it, so I didn't think the usual sarcasm alert was necessary, but I hadn't considered Cass. You should sue. She looked me over again. I hope they aren't charging you for that updo. Then she looked at her own hands. I get a discount, she said smugly. They stamp this little card for you, and every ten visits you get a free gel polish. I took a deep breath. She was as out of place in the creaky old stone barn as I would be, well, getting a gel polish. Why are you here, Cass? I wasn't expecting you. Did you bring Hawthorne? He's my son. Of course I brought him. What did you think I'd do with him? I was tempted to say I would have expected her to have dumped him on mum and dad, much as she'd done on many occasions since he was born, but I didn't say it. There wasn't the time for an argument. I had 85 recently lambed ewes to feed. So, where is he? I looked around as though I expected my nephew to pop out from behind the feed sacks. Cassie stood up. I sent him to explore. Explore? Cass, farms are dangerous, you know that. You can't leave a child roaming around unattended. I started towards the door, which was actually just a bit of tin propped against the crumbling cob wall. 
it didn't really stop much, except the worst of the wind. Three ewes and their lambs had belted through it yesterday and left it bulging and corrugated where it hadn't been before. He's 12, Dora. That's like practically 40 in child years. Cass came out of the barn after me, the familiar note of justification and complaint in her voice. God, had I really been listening to that since she learnt to talk? How hadn't I brained her with the Encyclopedia Britannica? Twelve? Was he? When had that happened? Last time I'd seen my nephew, he'd been a small, pale boy, the only one who could work the elaborate TV and program the oven. I thought he was about seven. Cass did the hair toss again. The wind outside the barn came funneled directly down the valley and tossed it right back. Yorkshire in March doesn't give much quarter. Twelve, she said again. As you'd know if you ever came to visit, which you don't, because... Actually, why don't you ever come home, Dor? We stood side by side for a moment, the sturdy walls of the old stone barn behind us, the unreeling endlessness of the dale in front of us. I waved a hand. Sheep, was all I said. That's no excuse. Cass pouted into the weather. The weather was not the least impressed, and neither was I. And we're here because Mum and Dad are getting an extension. There must be some kind of consequential string of actions that led to Mum and Dad's potential extension, sending my sister and her son from London to Yorkshire, but I wasn't sure what. Tell me, I said with the sternness of the older sister, but without references to your hairdresser, your yoga guru, Pilates, or any one of your million friends. If you can, I added, because Cass tended towards verbosity as I tended towards fruitcake. We walked back across the yard to the house while Cass explained. To her credit, she managed to cut out most of what her friends said, why she went to twice-weekly yoga, how Jeanette Riley had had to leave town suddenly, the advisability of expensive shoes, and the opening of a new Ted Baker shop on the high street. Not all of it, obviously, but she did her best. So they're building a kind of granny annex for you and Hawthorne? I tried to pracy as I opened the kitchen door and we were greeted by a whirl of collie and the smell of ancient casserole. Yes, we were tired of sharing a bathroom and now he's getting older, there's too many wet towels. Cass pulled a chair from under the table and sat down wearily, as though she'd personally trudged the 200 odd miles with her son on her back, rather than caught a train to York and taken a taxi the rest of the way. And Dad had probably driven her to the station in the first place. And you've come to stay with me? I washed my hands at the big stone sink. Feeding the ewes could wait a few minutes, until I made sense of the situation, but I could hear the barring starting up. They'd heard my voice in the yard. Yeah, Cass said. Hotels are too expensive, apparently. What about school and your job? I looked in the fridge. I'd been sure there were some yogurts in there and I was hungry. The ewe had been trying to lamb for a couple of hours and I'd had to carry her into the barn to sort her out, so I'd missed breakfast. And actually, thinking about it, dinner last night. Job? Cass looked blankly at me for a moment. Oh, the shop? Oh, God, no, I haven't done that for ages. It was just so restrictive, what with me being a single mother and everything. Oh, there's Thor now. The door opened again and stayed open, letting the wind circle the kitchen. It crept over my shoulder and whirled some milk bottle tops in the fridge, as though it too was disappointed by the lack of yoghurt. Thor? Yeah, he decided Hawthorne is too babyish, didn't you, sweet? Hawthorne, looking about as far from Chris Hemsworth as was possible, while still being male and blonde, slunk into the room. He was taller than his mother now, with a face that still held the soft traces of a child, while his body had the height and long limbs of an adult. He needed to stop going up and start going sideways. There was a lot of filling out to do. Hawthorne grunted and perched on the window seat, staring out across the yard as though waiting for a helicopter to rescue him. There was a suspiciously yogurty smell about him, and some smears down his jeans that told me where the four-pack of Muller Corners had gone. So, what did you do while I was catching up with Auntie Pandora? 
Cassie's voice had become high-pitched and cutesy, and I knew this was just for effect by the way her son flinched. Updated my vlog, he said. My followers want to know what's happening with me. Thor runs a very popular YouTube channel, Cass said, in a voice so bright that one of the dogs covered its eyes. He's got nearly a thousand followers, haven't you, sweetie? Grunt. He's going to be an influencer when he finishes his education. She gave me a satisfied look, although I didn't really know what an influencer was, what they did, or why anyone would want to be one. Is that like hypnosis? I put the kettle on, sweeping the crumbs of a long-forgotten meal off the range to do so. Actually, yeah, Thor said. You're, like, paid to persuade people to buy stuff, clothes and sh- stuff? Thor is very internet savvy. Cass began wandering around the kitchen. I could see her comparing the small window, mismatched surfaces and bleak flagstone floor to our mother's. And, by literal extension, her kitchen back in Streatham. This kitchen was typical of a Yorkshire farmhouse. Small windows set in thick walls, enormous arga, dust, cobwebs and old feed sacks that the dogs slept on in the corner. There were almost no similarities between my kitchen and my mother's, except they both let daylight in and had a cooker. My mother's kitchen had a glass roof and bifold doors. Mine barely had a roof. I had a moment of remembering my one brush with internet technology, a blog I'd started as a way of publicising the flock, showing what could be done to bring rare breeds back from the brink of extinction. It had become clear that nobody read it, Nobody was interested in the upper Rydale breed, and its extinction was a matter of concern to nobody except me. And possibly one other breeder, but he lived in New Zealand and was a touch obsessive about organic feed in pictures of feet, so I'd had to block him. Cass and Thor continued to sit. Is it nearly lunchtime? he asked eventually, not for one second relinquishing his gaze over the muddy yard where two hens were lazily pecking up some dropped feed. I'm starving. I'm sure Auntie Dora will find you something. Cass poked one of the collies with her foot. Do you always allow animals in the food preparation areas, Dor? Or are they meant to be outside? I had no idea why she framed everything as a question. A habit learned from our mother, I suppose, who never liked to say anything directly, but would instead rather skirt around a request or topic closing in on it like a well-trained sheepdog bringing a flock down off the hill. They live here, I said. And there's bread in the cupboard if you want to make a sandwich. How long are you staying? I hoped it was only a weekend. The lack of luggage, apart from Cass's overloaded mulberry bag, gave me hope. But if it was going to be longer, I'd need to get some food in. Apart from the bread and the lamented yogurts, there really wasn't much in the kitchen. Not sure. Depends on the extension. Dad said he'll give me a ring when the house is habitable again. Maybe three months? Three months? I echoed in a tone that couldn't help but imply the end of the world was not only nigh, but now. But where's your luggage? And what about school? Thor is homeschooled. I didn't miss the face that my nephew pulled at that. But then I shouldn't be surprised. Cass had been bringing up her son alternatively since he was born. Anything that was mainstream, you could guarantee she'd turn her back on, at least until the alternative idea also became mainstream, when she'd turn her back on that too. She had largely rotated her way through motherhood. Mum hired a tutor for him. There's another taxi. All the luggage is in there too. Cass looked distractedly towards the window. I wonder where they've got to. We've been here, well... It feels like forever now, and we haven't had any lunch, she finished pointedly. The kettle began to boil. I think there might be biscuits in here somewhere. I began a search of the counters and worktops, which ran around the kitchen walls at odd heights and angles, like a relief map of the county. They were mostly scattered with back copies of the local paper, brochures for feed and sprays, catalogues, show timetables and entry forms, and DEFRA regulations, which I printed off the computer every time they were updated. So, practically every day. It took a while to find the tin, and I suspected that it hadn't been opened since Christmas. Thor and Cass both jumped up as I rattled the lid off. 
they probably aren't vegan, I said. I didn't add, and they're probably six months past the best before date. They were biscuits. As far as I was concerned, they just went soggy, not off. Oh, we won't worry about that. Cass helped herself to a handful of chocolate digestives. That sounds like the other taxi. Dor, can you go out and give them a hand? Thor and I are eating. Thor, I thought as I slunk out of the kitchen, leaving the kettle and the biscuits. What on earth possessed her? It was one of the local taxi firms, and I was surprised they'd agreed to come all the way up to the farm. They usually refused to drive up the potholed suspension ruin of a lane and drop passengers half a mile down on the road. It really sorted out those who wanted to see me from those who had thought a 50-acre farm in Yorkshire would be a great selling opportunity for double glazing or expensive feed supplements. I stayed in the doorway, the bulk of the old house stopping the worst of the wind from reaching me. I'd spent most of the night checking on the sheep and trying to get them into shelter, and I was short on patience and energy for helping to hump suitcases. If Cass wanted her tutor and luggage to be met and greeted, then she could damn well do it herself. I was limited to opening the door, with maybe a spot of ushering through, if I could muster the oomph. Sort your bloody lane out, shouted the driver through his half-open window as he spun the taxi into a turn that sprayed mud and made the hens run for cover. I just smiled. If it kept unwanted visitors at bay, an unmade track was fine by me. The driver got out, still grumbling, opened the boot and began pulling out a succession of suitcases, rucksacks, bags and carriers, dumping them into the murk that was the yard surface after a wet winter. The furthest rear door opened. There was a moment of mumbled consultation and a kerfuffle with a card machine, and then the passenger climbed out, stretching a spine that probably felt six inches shorter after the pummeling of the trackway. I took half a step forward, mustering a smile that, while it probably wasn't welcoming, might at least mitigate the worst of the wind and the mud, only to stop, horrified. Is this Folly Farm? Good, wasn't sure that taxi driver knew his way once we got out of York. Hello, I'm Thor's tutor. It was Leo. Fucking Leo fucking Drayfield was standing in my farmyard. I wondered if it was too late to get a shotgun license. Chapter Two The sheep needed me a lot that afternoon. In fact, I managed to stay outside until well after dusk had flooded into the dale, driving the day into pinpricks of light from the windows and doors of distant buildings. There were ewes and lambs to feed and check over, some as yet unlambed ewes to bring down closer to the house to make the late night walk round easier. The dogs needed work, and it was astonishing how untidy the feed shed had got. And while I worked, I talked to myself. It was a habit I'd got into lately, mostly because it was nice to hear a human voice, above all the barring and the barking and the occasional cluck of a broody or startled hen. It reassured me that I could still carry a conversation, even if it was rather one-sided. Most of my vocalizations were shouted commands to the dogs, or yelled imprecations at the sheep when the bastards had gone through another wall, or managed to find themselves upside down in a bramble patch. So a lot of what I did these days was to the monotone mutter that would have had me shut away a century ago. Why the hell is he here? At least he doesn't seem to recognise me, that's one thing to be grateful for. But how long can that go on? I suppose he never knew my family, so there's no reason to put it all together, but... And a tutor? I wonder if Cassandra knows about him. Well, no, she'd never have let him teach her son if she did. Oh, who the hell am I trying to convince? Cass would let Jack the Ripper teach Thor if it meant she was free to go for a spray tan. No, that's mean. She loves her son, of course she does. But let's face it, what kind of loving mother gives their child the name Hawthorne? and then abbreviates it to Thor. I suppose it's better than calling him Hor. The air had gone still, which meant there'd be a frost tonight. I checked the boundary fence of the little field where I put the ewes I thought likely to lamb overnight. I didn't want to be striding over the hills in search of an escaped ewe in trouble, or a lamb that had got separated from its mother. Not at four in the morning, anyway. And this far north, we could still have snow, even though it was March. 
Nobody had really got over 2013 when the snow had come suddenly, fierce and late, and people had been walking the high hills in drifts taller than they were to try to find lost animals and bring them home. One ewe, a little cockier than the rest, butted her head against my leg. It was Willow, a three-year-old whom I'd raised on the bottle when her mother died. She hadn't outgrown the attachment and tended to regress to lambhood whenever she saw me, which resulted in some interesting bruises down my legs and a reluctance to hand rear orphaned lambs. Fortunately, the upper Rydale was an excellent mother, tended towards single lambs or twins at worst, and lacked the usual ovine habit of dying, given the slightest excuse. Bugger off, I muttered at her without much real conviction. Willow barred happily and trotted after me, her sides round with incipient lamb and a good fleece. I sold my fleeces to hand spinners at a premium and, in consequence, owned many of my ewes in the form of socks, hand warmers and, in one case, a fireside rug. They weren't pets, they were a commercial enterprise. They were my living and I had to remind myself of that sometimes when I got particularly attached. Off, go! I shoved a booted foot out. Willow stopped, wrinkled her nose at me, and then pretended that she'd seen a particularly juicy bit of grass over in the corner of the paddock. She was fooling no one. The place was mud, feeders and strewn hay, and if there was a blade of fresh grass in here, then I was her natural birth mother. But at least she had stopped me thinking about the shit show that my previously calm, if somewhat impecunious, life had just become. Three months? of my sister, who made Lucretia Borgia look like Mother Teresa, and her son, who appeared set to sharpen his teeth and eat his way through the flock, uncooked. And now Leo Drayfield. Maybe I could move into the old shepherd's hut up on the high moor and pretend that lambing lasted until July. I could let them have the run of the house and yard and only come down for supplies, like a particularly rigorous ascetic. The idea had an appeal, and, in fact, wouldn't be too different from the life I lived at the moment, only it would mean peeing in a bucket instead of having a mostly functional bathroom. I doubted that online supermarkets would deliver to a hut in the hills, but apart from that, yep, yeah, pretty much the life I was living now. And it would have the added bonus of keeping me well away from Chris, who had a bit of a tendency to pop over to check if I wanted what he called a bunk-up, whenever Elvie was busy doing whatever it was she did with rugs and tack and 15 horses and ponies. I never did want any kind of uppage from Chris. Been there and quite literally done that. But he kept trying. I suppose his determination not to accept a negative outcome was a good thing in a vet, but it was incredibly annoying in a bloke who disappointed me in just about every way. At last, I really couldn't stay out any longer. I was hungry, the dogs needed feeding, and the long columns of light laid across the yard showed that at least two bedrooms had been allocated. I ought to go in and warn them about the floorboards and the random tendency of some of the doors to fall off. At least they'd had the decency to occupy rooms at the front of the house, overlooking the yard, which meant that I would still be sleeping in the wonderful isolation of the rear part of the farmhouse, which looked out over the moorland, and where I'd mostly got to grips with the missing floorboards. Oh, there you are! Cass was sitting at the table, flicking her way through a women's magazine. There was no sign of the testosterone contingent. I've been online and ordered a delivery. Oh, that was nice of... I used your card. You left your details logged in on the shop's site, Cass continued. It's coming in the morning, so one of us will have to be here to unload. But you don't really leave the place much, do you? So you'll be around. She turned over a page and made a face. Oh, now look, that's not really an outfit, is it? I mean, who can't coordinate shoes and bag? It's like Fashion 101. Shoes, bag, and, if you must, hat. Her people want shooting. Where are Thor and Leo? Who? I stared at her. I knew she didn't have a lot of short-term memory for anything that didn't come with a website address, but I was fairly sure she'd remember those two. Your son and the tutor. Oh, his name is Nat. What did you call him? So, Leo had changed his name, had he? I wondered what else he'd changed about himself. 
Sorry, I must have misheard him. Where are they? Thor's updating his vlog again, and Nat is prepping some work. We gave Thor a few days off for moving up here, but Nat's got a whole scheme of lessons for him based around the locality. History, geography, stuff like that, I think. Cass sounded completely offhand. I leave that all up to him. Did... did Nat say anything about me? I asked cautiously. Maybe he had recognised me. Twelve years was a long time, and I'd changed a fair bit since then. But I had recognised him, so maybe it wasn't that long. Unless, I thought hopefully, he'd had a severe blow to the head, or a bit of time in a coma or something, and his memory had been wiped. Or maybe I had changed so much that he genuinely didn't recognise me. I thought back to who I'd been then. Yes, I'd changed a lot. Just about everything, in fact. Cass laughed. Conceited much? Of course he didn't say anything about you. You only said about two words to one another in the yard and then you were off, shafting hefts or whatever it is you do out there. Nat barely even noticed your existence. Cass folded the magazine closed on the table. I hope you're not going to start flirting with every man that comes around, Dora. I know you're nearly 31 and still single, but honestly, it looks desperate. Try to relax a bit. I'm sure someone will want you before you're too old and wrinkly to have any looks left. She squinted at me. Although it might be a wee bit late now, but, well, people find someone even when they're really old, don't they? I stared at her for a second. Did you originally come with a filter and it fell off in the wash or something? Sorry. She sounded completely unapologetic. But it's true. Can I point out that you aren't in a couple either, and you're nearly 29, so it's not as though you're far behind me? I began scooping feed from the sack of dog food under the sink, while the collies gyrated around my legs. But I have Hawthorne. I don't need anyone else. Cass came to stand by the arger, in the way. One of the dogs ran over her foot, and she squeaked exaggeratedly and lifted her leg up. I don't think animals should be allowed in the house, Dora. My animals, I said, putting the two dog bowls down pointedly right in front of her. My house, my choice. If you don't like it, then maybe you should go back to Streatham. In fact, even if you do like it, why not go back to Streatham anyway? Just a suggestion. We're not going to be in your way or anything. We'll live our own lives, even if that is practically impossible in this backwater of civilization. But still, you'll hardly know we're even here. Two seconds later, there was a thundering on the stairs, and Thor hurtled into the kitchen, iPad held up in front of his face, shrieking, And this is where I'm having to eat. It's like medieval or something, and there's, like, not a Nando's for miles. Then he whirled around, presumably making sure that the video fully captured the awfulness, while his mother and I stood like a couple of film props. After a few seconds of spinning, he flushed us both a grin and slammed back out through the kitchen doorway, and we heard his footsteps echoing off the main staircase as he headed back upstairs again. Vlog, said Cass smugly. He's got nearly a thousand followers. Yes, you said. So, a thousand adolescents had now seen the inside of my kitchen. I didn't usually even let the postman in. What happened to privacy and consent and all that? This is my home, Cass. She stood up and stretched. At a guess, her jeans cost more than the monthly feed bill, and her top was probably hand-knitted from unicorn wool by Atlantean refugees. Thor is just expressing himself. I don't want him to grow up all repressed and downtrodden like you, Dora. I want him to have a life. Excitement and risk and danger and adrenaline. Some thrills and spells. Not plodding on through life. From above our heads, where we could hear Thor thundering along the landing at the front of the house, there came a sudden crack, and then his voice wailing down the staircase. Ow! Ow! Mum! My, my leg, Mum! He's put his foot through the floorboards, I said evenly. It's not a good idea to go running about up there. Thor! Cass started out for the kitchen door. Don't worry, sweetie. I'll get... I'll get some germaline or something. Then she turned to me, eyes narrowed. 
This place isn't fit for human habitation, Dora. Grandad would be turning in his grave if he could see what you've done to his farm. She spat the words viciously over her shoulder and then slammed the hall door as she headed for the stairs, calling, How is it, sweetie? Does it hurt? I stood very still under the fluorescent tube that illuminated the kitchen. It hummed slightly, and the dogs were making growly, gobbling noises over their dinners. But apart from that, it was quiet now Cass had gone. Excitement and risk and danger and adrenaline, I said, watching a small spider swing determinedly from a single thread up in the beams of the ceiling. Yeah, right. I would never, absolutely never, let Cass know how her words had hurt me. That she got right to the painful centre of everything I worried about. What would Grandad think of how I ran the farm? Then I grabbed my torch and went out to check on the ewes again. It was a relatively quiet night. Two ewes lambed, but easily and without me needing to intervene. They'd been standing, backed into the thick hedge that surrounded the paddock, wobbly lamb at foot and a slightly defiant look on their woolly faces when I did the three o'clock check. They'd both had the sense to give birth tucked into the sheltered corner where the frost wasn't too severe and the lambs looked sturdy and were suckling well. Willow trotted over to make sure that I hadn't brought her a bottle. She still liked to check, even though she'd been weaned for over two and a half years, and was severely butted away by one of the new mothers. It boded well for good, protective motherhood, so I climbed back over the gate and left them all to it, crunched my way over the frozen yard puddles and back into the house, where even the collies hadn't bothered to get up from in front of the arger to accompany me. I hadn't put on the overhead light, just one of the small lamps over in the corner where I kept the computer, so the kitchen emitted a dull glow that shone through the window and the slightly open door, beckoning me back inside. This was one of the times I loved. Everywhere was silent. Even the milking machine down the valley wouldn't fire up for another hour or so yet. The only people walking the night were those who made no sound. Even the house had stopped its creaking and settling, and pretty much the only noise came from the occasional collie twitch against the feed sack bed and the odd drifting bar as a worried lamb called for its mother in the far field. Quiet. Dark. How I liked it. So when I heard a voice from the far side of the kitchen, I nearly screamed in frustration and terror. I didn't think anyone else would be up. It was Leo slash Nat, wearing a huge hoodie and sitting slumped over a mug at the table. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. I don't sleep well and I thought I'd make a cup of tea. Kettle's boiled, by the way. He was almost invisible, shrouded in the shadows that the kitchen kept, even if all the main lights were on. I was checking the sheep, I said, as though I needed to excuse my presence in my own house. The kettle was still giving out a whisper of steam, so I poured water into a mug to give my hands something to do. I could not think of anything else to say. It's good of you to put us all up, he continued. Cass said it came as a bit of a shock to you, but you don't normally mix much. I gave a hollow laugh. I bet she didn't say it like that, though. No. His voice was measured, but giving nothing away. No, she didn't. Did he recognise me? There was nothing in his tone that sounded as though he knew who he was talking to. Had he said anything to Cass? But then she wouldn't know, would she? I was just her sister. Just Pandora the boring. Pandora the normal. Pandora the no trouble to anyone. I had to make sure. How did you come to be recruited as Thor's tutor? Vague enough. He could give me as much backstory as he wanted to that. I kept my back to him as I poured and stirred and checked the biscuit tin. It was empty. I grew up in London, got a master's degree in child development and psychology, did a bit of private tutoring last summer and I enjoyed it, so when I saw the advert for a full-time tutor for Thor, I reckon I'd give it a go. Thor seems to like me, we get along well and he's a bright boy. I didn't mind coming all the way to Yorkshire to carry on, so... Here I am. Grew up in London. So he didn't recognise me. If he did, he wouldn't have needed to say that. My heart had stopped stomping its way up my throat, 
but my palms were still sweaty. Whereabouts in London did you grow up? I hid the hoarseness of my voice by dipping my face into my mug. It was my sheep farmer's do it to you mug. Chris had bought it for me on my last birthday. It was the sort of thing he found hilarious. I used the mug around the house and yard in the hope it might shatter into a thousand tiny unmendable bits, but it was proving surprisingly resistant. Streatham, I was surprised when I met your sister and your parents. It's not far from where I live for a while. Still, London is a big place. No reason we would have all bumped into one another, is there? Funny that. You can live practically down the road from someone for a long time and never even meet them. I couldn't refute that. I'd lived here for seven years and only met the bloke from the next farm along twice, accidentally, up on the high moor looking for lost sheep. Yes, London's a big place, I echoed. He didn't know me. Well, he'd never known my name, my real name. Never met my family, and I'd never so much as mentioned him to them, and I looked different now. No reason he would even think of me these days. He's clearly reinvented himself too. Well, I'd better... I stepped out of my Wellingtons, left them beside the Arga. Lots to do tomorrow. I couldn't see his face. It was just a sketch of hoodie and mug, outlines drawn in shadow against the table, from the pool of light way across the kitchen. Of course. Good night. He raised his mug in a toast to me. Good night, Matt. With my socks making hushing sounds against the flagstone floor, I shuffled my way hastily out of the room and up the stairs to my room, where I lay on the bed with my face hot and tight, in a mixture of panic and half-satisfied relief. Chapter Three I took the first lot of ewes and lambs, the ones that were big enough now not to need checking over quite so often, down to the far field in the trailer. It bounced about behind the tractor to the accompaniment of the odd distracted bar, but nobody fell over as I inched the ancient Massey Ferguson down the little track. It wasn't quite the furthest field from the house. That was the ten acre that bordered the road into the village, which I rented to Elvie for grazing. But it was still far enough to make getting the tractor out worthwhile, rather than trying to herd thirty ewes and their wayward lambs down. The dogs were good, but the hedges that lined the track weren't entirely stockproof. I needed to get out with the electric fencing when the weather improved a bit. Dax, the big collie, sat in the tractor with me. Bet stayed in the yard, eyeing the chickens and waiting for our return. When I drove back up, trailer empty and rattling like a bean can with rocks in, Nat and Thor were in the yard too. Nat was pointing up at the roof of the barn while Thor was writing something down in a small exercise book. The sun had decided to make an appearance today and was illuminating the whole yard like a spotlight on a play. I jounced over the final ruts and cut the engine, which died reluctantly and with many misfires and splutters. I really needed to get the thing serviced. Hello, Nat said cheerily. The food delivery arrived while you were gone. Cass is sorting it out in the kitchen. Thor lowered his book and looked at me. Can I have a go on the tractor? No. I jumped down, preceded by Dax. The tractor was ancient. It had been on the farm so long that I feared its wheels might fall off if I tried to take it anywhere else. It had been Grandad's, and he'd never got round to having a cab fitted, so it was just roll bars and seat. And he'd only added the roll bar when Grandma told him she'd divorce him if he didn't make it safe. They'd save you from the worst of the impact if the tractor turned over, but that was as good as it got. Grandad had been very robust in his attitude to health and safety. I definitely didn't want to risk Thor getting up on it. It would be like putting a baby on a racehorse. We've been studying the cruck roof of the barn, Nat said. He carried on explaining something to Thor, probably trying to distract him from the tractor, at which he was looking much as Chris had used to look at models on Instagram. So now you can go and sketch it if you like, he finished. Go inside, see how it's been constructed. Thor gave the tractor a last ogle and mooched off. He was wearing expensive-looking trainers, but they were getting scuffed in the mud, and he hadn't even done up the laces. Sorry about that, Matt said. 
He's easily distracted, unfortunately. I had to do it. I had to. It was like pressing a bruise. You're Nat Drayfield, yes? He inclined his head. Did you ever know someone called Leo Drayfield? He went out with a friend of mine for a while. I just wondered. Nat had raised his head. There was an expression on his face that I wasn't familiar with. A kind of calm acceptance mingled with a little bit of... anger? Leo was my brother, he said, and his voice had the tiniest wobble to it. He died eight years ago. Leo. Dead. I felt my body flush with a feeling like grief, and my mouth was suddenly full of words I wanted to say, questions I wanted to ask but daren't. And then came the feeling of relief, the slackening of muscle and the rise of laughter to the back of my head. Leo. Dead. It was all over. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, trying to stop myself from smiling, whilst at the same time fighting the pressure behind my eyes that told me I might cry. You're very like him. A sharp look. Although... Weren't Nat's eyes a little more hazel than Leo's had been? Wasn't his hair a darker shade of that undefined colour that went blonder in the sun? And he was taller, definitely. You knew him? There was a tone of disbelief now, as though Leo had been kept in the cellar and denied to all but close family. I met him once or twice, through my friend. We were standing quite close together now, as though what we were saying was secret. They didn't realise quite how close we were until Cass suddenly popped up behind Nat's shoulder with a look of horror on her face. What are you doing? Nat met my eye. Again, he had an expression I couldn't read. He gave his head the tiniest shake. I didn't know if it was aimed at me or whether he was just clearing his thoughts. Or it could have been the fact that Cass had practically shouted in his ear and he was checking that his eardrums weren't perforated. Your sister was asking about my family. Turns out she knew someone who knew my late brother. Cass looked slightly mollified. Well, okay, but you are being paid to teach Thor, and I can't see you doing it right now. Where is he? He's in the barn, drawing. I felt obliged to say something in Nat's defence. Did Cass have to be so horrible? It wasn't even as though she were paying Nat. That would be our mother. Our mother had been paying for almost everything for Thor ever since the day he was born. According to Mum, Cass pleaded poverty, youth, lack of qualifications to get a good job. Then when she got the job in the shop, she pleaded lack of time. Now she was back to pleading poverty again. But I think our parents had stopped listening about a decade ago. It has a crook roof, Nat started to explain, but Cass had glazed over. Well, all right, but don't distract them during lessons she said to me, and then bobbed away again. Her strange gait was caused by her trying to avoid the mud and the puddles and the chickens in her cutesy little kitten-heeled shoes that were about as suitable for walking through a farmyard as my footwear was for hosting a society dinner. God, she's ghastly, I said without thinking. Nat laughed. She has her moments, but she's my employer, so you never heard that from me. Well, she's my sister, and I still think she's awful. Nat turned to head towards the barn. I'm sure you love each other, he said, deep down. If by deep down you mean in hell, then that's probably what it will come to, I said darkly. He laughed and walked away, calling out for Thor as he went. Dax followed after them in case they might be doing something interesting in the barn. Bet trailed after me as I went into the house after Cass. She was standing in the kitchen, surrounded by shopping bags. There seemed to be an awful lot of them, and the food I could see spilling over the plastic rims wasn't anything I usually ordered. You better unpack. Cass titupped over the flags, her pretty little heels sounding like cat's claws. Before some of this defrosts. I went to the sink to wash my hands. I was absolutely not going to jump just because she said so. Why don't you unpack, I said 
You had no idea how long I was going to be down at the bottom field. It might all have defrosted while you were waiting for me to come and do it for you. I kept my back to her, soaping my hands more thoroughly than usual to drag the hand washing out for longer. The delivery man has just left. It will be fine. And I don't know where you keep all your food. If I put it away, it would only be in the wrong places. Damn. This was logical thinking, which I was unused to from my sister. Anyway, I only had these nails put on three days ago. I don't want to snap one now, not with it being miles to the nearest salon. That was more like it. I began unpacking, putting food for the pantry on the side and food for the fridge. Well, in the fridge. Even Cass could have managed to find that. It was huge and sulked in one whole corner of the kitchen, occasionally splitting the piece of the farm with its terrifying motor. So, what are you going to do with your time while you're here? I weighed a jar of peanut butter in my hand. Peanut butter? I hadn't eaten that since I was about seven, and from the slenderness of Cass, she hadn't let a nut pass her lips since she discovered tight jeans. It must be for Thor. Did you keep it in the fridge or the cupboard? I thought I might do an online course.